Okay, so welcome to my talk about dependency management in PowerShell. Uh, I'm Chris Gardner. I'm a Cloud and Data Center Management MVP. I do Azure, DevOps, PowerShell, the difficult things, all, you know, all the stuff we usually do in our lives. So we're going to talk about a couple of things today. We're going to talk about why, we're going to, why we care about dependencies and why we should manage them. We're going to talk about the different types of dependencies. We're going to talk about hash requires, which most of you have probably seen at some point. We're going to talk about module manifests, which hopefully most of you have seen or know about. Uh, we're going to go into a bit of a deeper dive on required modules within that. And then we're going to look at PS Depend, which is a, an interesting tool for helping to manage dependencies. So why should I care? We've got all of these wonderful dependencies, but what, what, why should I care about them? Firstly, don't reinvent the wheel. We, we all like building tools that are reusable and sharing them, at least as much as we can. Unfortunately, we see that the PowerShell community, like many other communities, seems to really love reinventing the same things over and over again. So we've got a bunch of modules. Well, we have some modules for dealing with Excel. We've kind of settled on import Excel. We've got a bunch of modules for dealing with like HTML output, Word output, talking to various systems, and there's not really a need to as such. Like everyone has their own spin on how they want to do it, but it would be better if we just like contributed to those existing projects where possible. So I know lots of people, when they first think of solving a problem, their solution is, I'm just going to start writing some code and see what I can do. Whereas hopefully people will more push towards checking GitHub or the PowerShell gallery first, or if you're really in a really deep hole, TechNet, which I really wish it would die. Um, but it's only at that point when you're like, okay, no one solved this problem, how do I go about solving it? Or no one solved this problem yet, or maybe they've solved it, and you're like, oh, well, that doesn't really do what I want, but it's part of the way there. Like, chuck a couple of PRs in there, contribute back to it so then other people can use it, and we don't end up with like five different modules for writing Word documents. And luckily, we only want, well, one major module for working with Excel, which is what everyone loves working with. The other big reason, security and code reviews. So a bunch of us work in, with customers or in industries that care about security more than others. We all care about security, probably, or should, but you know, some, of, some people have strong guidelines in place, policies. They go through wonderful audits. Everyone loves those. Um, so we, if, if we have, have a documented way that our man, of our documented thing for our dependencies, then we know exactly what's been cleared, what hasn't been cleared. If we're going to go through a different version change, we're like, okay, well, these things are fine. We need to still get these other things we're depending on reviewed again. Because, lots of, again, lots of people have those, oh, well, I've got to go through compliance for, for the newest version of our application, and now I need to get all of my dependencies checked again. If you're using NPM, good luck with that. If you're using PowerShell, not so difficult. You know, you don't have 250 gig worth of NPM modules. And it makes code reviews internally a lot simpler as well. You're like, okay, I don't need to review all of this other code this person's written because we're not changing what version we're depending on. And on top of that, easier testing. So if I'm testing my code, which hopefully most of us are, or are going to start, then I know I don't need to test those versions because they haven't changed. They're the same versions we've been using for the last two years because that's what we know works. All of our code is built on it. Makes life a lot simpler if we don't have to worry about that stuff. So I want to mention versioning a lot because it's very, very important to managing your dependencies. Most of the PowerShell community it doesn't have a development background. We saw that on Tuesday in Tobias's keynote where he showed most people don't know C Sharp and don't want to know it. Fair enough, but the an unfortunate, I don't want to say an unfortunate, part of our jobs now is as soon as you're writing PowerShell, you are a developer. Even if it's not your job title, even if it, you don't want to be a developer, it is part of what you do by writing code and pressing save. And hopefully putting it in the source control, but that's a different conversation. So as part of that, we need to care about versioning and what, how we version our stuff. .NET does four-part versioning. You've probably seen it all over the place. 
PowerShell does four parts or three parts or two parts, whatever you feel like. The industry as a whole is pushing towards semantic versioning, which is three part versioning with some pre release stuff on that we don't, mostly don't care about. Um, but the important part about versioning um, is that, and this, this is how programming has worked for a long time, or should have worked for a long time, I guess, um, is when you're making breaking changes to your module, which is inevitable, you will increment the major version number. Because then, a cut, then your users, whoever they may be, can see, OK, if that's gone from version 1 to version 2, I better test everything to make sure it still works as I expect it to work. Because you can't guarantee that. If you're doing anything else, and ma making any changes that are backwards compatible, increment the minor the patch number, or whatever the other numbers, however many you may have. But having that major version number changing is a sign to your users that this might not work for what you expect, because it's changing how they interact with the module, or the, whatever it is you've written. And that might just be a case of, oh, it takes a new parameter, or one of the parameters is now mandatory, or the object comes out differently. But those are big, impacting changes to how your users interact with modules, and how you, as users, interact with other modules. So if we can start pushing people to do versioning better, Microsoft included, some of them are really, really bad at versioning, um, then everyone's lives gets easier. So let's talk about dependency types. So there are two key types of dependencies. You have your runtime dependencies, stuff I need for this thing to run. So you have things like your AD module. If I'm talking to Active Directory, I probably need the AD module installed, assuming I'm using those commands. Or I'm talking to Exchange. I probably need an Exchange server there, which you might have, you might not, whatever. You've got an endpoint that you're talking to for Exchange purposes. You need some way of interacting with that, whether that's through the Exchange snap-ins, if you're unfortunate, or through the implicit remoting and the other stuff that they do. But then the other option is build dependencies. And I'm going to use the word build and similar a lot because I deal with software developers every day now, and that's just the language they use. And it's kind of where we're going with PowerShell as well for a lot of people. But this is the stuff that you need to build or test your code. So that might be Pesta. That might be a script analyzer. Or it could be a full AD infrastructure so you can run your tests against it. Hopefully, it's not your production one, but you know, you can test where you can. But there's a very distinct difference between these two. And you will often need those runtime dependencies at build time, but you very rarely need those build time dependencies at runtime, because you already have them, hopefully. So let's see hash requires. We've probably all seen this. It's a nice little comment somewhere in your script that says, this requires you running as an admin. And you get a lovely error if you can't run as admin, or if you're not running as admin. So a few little requirements of it. It must be the first thing on a line. It doesn't matter too much where in the script that line is, but it has to be the first thing. You can put multiple on the same line and like just add the, the kind of basic like parameters, just add them together. It's less readable, but it works. Um, the best practice advice is always put it at the top of the script, because then you can see it as soon as you open the script file. It doesn't work inside of a function or a script block. So if you put your hash requires inside of a function, that's never going to work. If you put it in a script block that you pass into invoke command, for example, that's not going to do anything. It's just not going to work. If you put, in fact, if you put it in a file and then invoke command that file, that's also not going to work because it turns into a script block. Um, that was an interesting discussion on Twitter on Monday on the way here. But it, it, it does a bunch of stuff. It require, it'll say, yep, you've got to have these modules available, or you've got to be an admin, you've got to be in this version of PowerShell. If you're unlucky, you've got to have a specific snap-in, or a, one or two other things. Um, it's all pretty well documented. Do get help at about underscore requires. It's all there. So let's have a look at some about requires stuff. And everyone see that in the back? It's all good? Right. So here's a nice and simple one saying we've got to be at least in version 3. So that the version 1 is a minimum version number. So in this case, version 3. Great. So I've got PowerShell 5.1 here, so I can do uh, requires. Uh, 
We're in version 3. That's not very big, but let's boost that size a bit. So that didn't help much, but you can see it's aware, yep, we're definitely in at least version 3 or above. If I do the same thing from PowerShell Core, Again, that's the way, yep, all good. We're in version three or above. Everyone's happy. But then we can also do higher numbers. So if we do, got to be in version six or above. PowerShell's like, PowerShell call, perfectly happy. Windows PowerShell, not so much. There was a nice error saying, sorry, the version of PowerShell you're on is 5.1, which isn't greater than 6.0. If we do that in this, this version of PowerShell call that I've got, or I guess it's technically PowerShell now. Um, yeah. This is, yep, we're in version 6 or above because PS version table versus PS, ver uh, PS version says I'm in version 9 because I built this earlier saying make yourself version 9 and it did. So as, uh, the, the version thing is a minimum version number and if you want to build PowerShell and claim you're in the future, great. The joys of open source. So again, same thing, just a dash version. I'm not sure why my PS version table stuff didn't show up, but that's not important. Then let's look at runners admin. I'm sure that this is probably the one most people will use in their scripts day to day. The other stuff we'll talk about where you use it, but this is the one you have to put in a script for it to work. The module manifest doesn't handle it. But those times when you're like, okay, I've got something that requires running as an admin because I'm uninstalling printers or doing stuff in elevate that needs an elevated session for like removing software, for example. Uh, run as admin, PowerShell is like, nope, sorry, you're, you're not an admin. You need to be an admin prompt. So I've got that over here, and that's tiny as well. Fixed all the sizes earlier. This one's like, yep, no problem, you're an admin. Um, I normally have my prompt set up to show whether I'm in an admin prompt or not. The best you've got at the moment is like a tiny little bar at the, in the top of the header. But I wanted to keep the prompt a little clean. So it's, that's a really useful way of making sure people aren't do, doing admin stuff in non-admin prompts. Or if you've got a script that does a bunch of stuff, some of which is uninstalling some software. But there's a bunch of other stuff going on in the script as well, and you run it in non-admin prompt, you go, crap. There's a bunch of stuff's happened, and then it's died because it can't uninstall some software. Then a bunch of other stuff's happened, and now I can't rerun this script because those bits that have already happened are going to throw errors now because I haven't put the right checks in or whatever. So having that at the top just says, the script's not even going to run at all. Then we've got modules. We all use modules all over the place, hopefully. Um, I say, hash requires this module, thread job in this case. Nice and simple one. I don't have that installed on my um, Windows PowerShell box uh, modules. Again, get a nice little error. Script doesn't run at all saying you, you don't have thread job. Everything's good. I can do that in here uh, where I do have it. And it's, yep, we've got thread job and it's imported it for me, which is quite nice. Well, apparently only export. What's one command in this version? Oh, well. Um, so yeah, nice and simple, lets you manage when scripts can run for the modules that they need. So again, you can do requires Active Directory for those AD scripts that create users and stuff. And that way, if you try to run it on a box that doesn't have AD, or the AD module doesn't run, and you get a nice helpful message to remind you why. It doesn't like get halfway through and go, oh, sorry, can't do it. And you don't need to keep putting your import module Active Directory stuff in there, because we don't need that anyway. The other option is you can specify multiple modules as an array. So again, I've got Microsoft Teams, and then I can provide a hash table for what module and what version of that module I want. Or at least in this case, it's the minimum version, because you can also do required version, which is generally the better way to do it, because then you're explicit about exactly what version you require and what version you should be using as part of this. So this, this works exactly the same way. So if I do this over here, 
this works fine. It takes a, little sec a few seconds because it's imported uh, Teams and PS Depend. Whereas over here, it won't work because I don't have either of those available. Unfortunately, the only downside of this is it only tells you the first one that's missing, not all of them, which is a little bit of a pain, but you know, it, you just then look at the script file and go, oh, actually, that's the, mod that's the other modules I know I need to install just in case. So, let's jump back to here. So, any questions about, PS to, uh, about hash requires so far? So the question was, do the modules have to be present before script execution or can you download them as part of it? They have to be there beforehand because it's checking if, you, if the module is available and then it imports it for you. Yep. Can you specify a particular major or minor version? Yes, yeah. so dash version is whatever you want. So I can put 5.1 in there and it'll only run on 5.1 but not 5. So, but if you could do, like, if you could say I want to do 5 point something and it could do 5.1, 2, 3 but it would never get to 6. No. You, you can't do, yeah, so the question was, can you specify a specific major or minor and minor version so you can do 5.1 but not 6? No. You, you can only do this version as a minimum version and it's everything above that. So the, the question, well, the, the question was: There's a bug in PowerShell 5.1 that if you have a module already imported, it'll try and re-import it. What was the rest of that? Sorry, I didn't catch the rest. Yep. So, so basically, that's the the PowerShell team's policy: is unless it's a security fix, it's not going into 5.1. Oh, oh, well, mostly, but yeah. That, that's just something we have to deal with. PowerShell 7 will solve all of our problems, probably. Yeah, it, it, re-importing the module usually isn't a problem, depending on what that module is and what weird things it does as part of importing. Any more questions? No, it's got to be a module name. Um, and you can, do, you can use the hash table format, but it has to be the name of the module because it just auto-imports it for you. Um, the, one useful thing I didn't show because I don't particularly like them, but um, you can also specify snap-ins if you have to. So if you're stuck with like Citrix or one of those other ancient technologies that still love snap-ins, even though they've been deprecated for 14 years or something, um, then you can specify snap-ins that way if you're really unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, can you put try catch around requires? Yes, I have no idea what it'll do. Because uh, it probably won't work because it's passed before it executes the script, as far as I'm aware. I haven't looked at the code paths and don't particularly want to because that's weird magic that I don't want to know. But yeah, I suspect it probably won't work. Fred, uh, Fred says that's how it works. Okay, great. Let's carry on and then we can do more questions a bit later on. So module manifests. How many people are writing modules? And why aren't the rest of you writing modules? They are the thing we use the most. They are reusable tools. We have really awesome things that come with them. As part of that, you should have a module manifest. They're not difficult. There's a command that just generates them for you. There's a bunch of commands that other people have that generate them for you. And it gives you a bunch of lovely metadata about your module for, for the gallery and other places. But very importantly, it also gives you a bunch of the benefits of hash requires, but in a a more centralized location. The only thing it won't do is snap-ins. No one really minds that too much because, again, they've been deprecated since version 2. Please, if you find vendors using snap-ins, please bother them and tell them to fix their stuff and update it to a module. It's a simple process. It's not difficult. They should sort it out. Uh, and you can't specify runners admin. But if you chuck that in one of the scripts or in the PSM1 file, it figures it out and it all works. 
yeah, every module should have a manifest. If you are writing a manifest as part of your module, or when you write a module, a manifest, make sure that the, the name and casing of the manifest is the same as the folder it's in, or the same as the, mod, as the module. Make sure the, the casing in particular is very important these days because we're cross-platform. Linux doesn't like case insensitivity and won't do it. So if your module is the wrong casing between the folder and the module manifest, Linux doesn't know what to do with it, won't import it. So and then your end users get very sad that they can't use your code and go and rewrite it themselves and reinvent the wheel. And then I get sad and yeah, no one wants that. It's expensive. Um, so then let's look at required modules. Because we all write code that depends on other code to some, at some point. We put this in the module manifest. It's a similar format to the hash requires in that you can specify just the name. What, what I call the short module info, which is basically the name and a version, or the long one, which is the name, a version, and the GUID for the module. Um, PowerShell Get will automatically install your modules for you if you don't have them. So if I have a bunch of dependencies and I go install that module, it'll figure it all out and pull them all down. But only if they're available in the same repository you're pulling the modules from. So if I've got pulling something down from the gallery, it'll install things perfectly fine from the gallery. If I'm doing it from an internal repo, but I'm depending on stuff that's in the gallery, then it just won't down, it won't install those for you. So feed pass through and stuff like that makes life a bit easier. Um, so let's have a look at some manifests. Really, really nice and complicated function here in my module, of get data. But then we have simple manifest. So we've got the usual stuff. We all know what module to import, what the version number is. I'm sticking with three-part versioning these days because PowerShell Get has some issues with things that are more than that. Um, nice GUID. No one really cares what that. You don't necessarily care too much what that is as long as there's something there and new GUID makes it. And they get a bunch of normal stuff. And then we have the important things. These are all of our different things we can set as requirements. So the good thing about manifest is, one, it's centralized. And two, you can specify much more things to require than just the things hash requires does, apart from runners admin. So I can specify the version. Again, minimum version, anything above this, and we're good. The host name that you want this to run in. So if you're writing something for VS Code, you can require it to be the same host name as VS Code's console is. Um, host version, similar sort of concept. You make sure it, it only runs in that type of host. So there's a couple of modules out there that work only in the ISE because they have requirements for the ISE or only in the host because that's where they work. Well, command prompt console thing. You can require specific .NET framework versions. So if you have stuff that uses some of the really cool stuff that's coming for 4.7.2 or 4.8 or soon three and five and whatever else we have, you can say this is the minimum version. It will only work from this point onwards. Again, same with CLR. I don't think I've ever seen anyone set that, but I'm sure someone has. I can probably check the, the gallery at some point. Um, processor architecture. So if you're writing some stuff that uh, works on, only in Raspberry Pis, you probably don't want to try and run it on a, like a normal PC. Um, it might work, it might not, but again, you don't want to run that risk of users executing your code in the wrong place. Um, let's skip required modules for a moment. You've got required assemblies, so if you're shipping a bunch of stuff with your module, yeah, sorry. Let's not worry about that. Yeah. I've got my watch, it'll be fine. Yeah. So, yeah, required assemblies, so if you've got external libraries that you require, you can chuck them in there. It'll sort of work from the GAC, but you're probably better off shipping them with your module so you get the exact version you require. Um, and a bunch of other stuff that is less important to talking about requirements. But yeah, uh, important note, if you're not exporting things like commandlets or variables and stuff, make sure it's an empty array. If you use a star, then it won't do anything. But when you use constrained language mode, your module also won't work. So make sure it's empty arrays if you're not exporting them, because constrained language mode is a thing, and it complains and doesn't work. So required modules. Simple array, like most of the rest of these things are, which takes names or hash tables, and these are the different formats we can use. So I just say, give me whatever version of Pesta you have available. If I'm installing this from the gallery, that'll be the latest version of Pesta. Or if I'm running it on my machine, 
it's probably an up-to-date version of Pesta because I try to stay up-to-date. If I'm installing it on a brand new version of new machine, it's going to be like 3.4 or whatever shipped with Windows. But then I can specify a minimum version of the module. So if I know 0.13 had some features I need, I can say that's the version at a minimum you have to use. Beyond that, I don't care. Um, below that, don't use them. They're not going to work. And then we can say required version. So this exact version of this module is the only one that will work. And that's the only one you should use. Because again, if I'm in an environment where I, I have to have specific dependencies and they have to be specific versions, then I want to be able to do this. And if I've gone through a huge auditing and compliance process that takes like weeks or months, I don't want to have to go through that whole thing again when a, main, a minor version changes. Some policies are a little looser on that. They're like, we're fine for minor versions, but major versions are important. So it depends on what policies you have to deal with. I just try to be as explicit as possible and then increment from there as, as I can. And then I can specify a GUID to make sure that only this version of the module gets installed, uh, imported, in case there are multiple versions of that module that, that someone hasn't decided I should probably copy the GUID as well because they're not aware of that. But as I say, yep, yeah, so if I import this from the gallery, everything works fine. The only, the only downside I have with, well, the only thing I dislike about required modules, and I know it's a problem currently in PowerShell Get as well, is that you can't specify a range. You can't say a minimum version of 2.0, a maximum version of 3.0, where 3.0 doesn't include itself. So if I want everything, any version of version 2, just that's fine. I'm perfectly happy with that, but not version 3, because I'm assuming there's going to be breaking changes that will ruin all of my scripts and all my modules. It's not an option at the moment. The PowerShell Get 3 discussion suggests they're going to ad adopt a new Get versioning scheme for setting ranges, which would be lovely. We'll see what happens with that. Comment on the RFC if you use PowerShell Get. It's it's important that you do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how required modules works. Pretty nice, nice and simple. It's all documented there. And because this is in source control, if this ever changes, I can see when it changed. Hopefully why it changed, if the person put in a sensible comment. Um, and then if I need to, I can go back to old versions. So any questions about manifests, required modules? Yes. So, so the question was, do, do you have to import the modules yourself? No, you don't. Again, re required modules are similar. Hash requires mod, and it'll just import them automatically for you before your module imports, which is quite important and also quite useful. It will slow down import time, obviously, depending on what you're importing. Fred was going to ask a question. Oh. Yes, yeah. So, th yeah, required modules... When you use install module, will install the dependencies and will import them before it, can, before it imports the module. So if you can't import those modules for whatever reason, it will tell you. Or at least it will fail and then you'll have to try and install all those, like import those dependencies first to see which one failed and why. Um, the error reporting around that could be better, but you know, it's open source. I could probably make it better at some point. So any more questions before I move on? Yep. So the question was, if you have multiple versions of a dependency installed, which version gets imported? Um, it depends on if you use module version or required version. If you specify required version, only that version will be imported. If you use module version, the latest version above that will be imported. Yes, Fred. Yes. So it, it goes through the PS module path in order until it finds one that matches your requirements. So if you have them spread across multiple places, it will just pick up the first one and be done, um, which, which can have an impact depending on where you have them installed and which versions they are. 
So how do we manage all of this stuff? Like, I, some of my dependencies are, like, my usual ones are Pesta, Platypus, uh, Script Analyzer, and whatever else that stuff. So Warren Frame, who most people probably know as Rambling Cookie Monster or PS Cookie Monster, wrote a tool called PS Depend. Um, it's pretty simple. You give it a, a, a hash table, basically, of dependencies, and it just installs them for you or it pulls them down for you um, and manages it all. So really important thing, if the dependencies go in a PowerShell or PSD1 file, you can track them with your code. So I can make sure that I have the required versions of modules as I go along. So six months time, I'm like, I've got to rebuild this old version of the module because users have reported bugs, I need to make sure I can replicate them. I can just check out that version of code, build it, and I get the same versions of the dependencies, assuming I've been sensible and said required version, not latest, and that can make sure it all works. For the most part, people use this for build dependencies. So things I require for, for building my PowerShell modules. So things like Pesta, Platypus, Script Analyzer, that stuff. And it will handle more than just PowerShell modules. It handles a whole ton of stuff. Um, so you can use this in CI pipelines, which is the main place I use it. I use it locally as part of my build scripts. Um, it's kind of similar to like the NPM and new, like NuGet config files that you get. Um, so let's have a quick look at it. Do I have one open? I don't think I did. So it's pretty simple. Everyone knows what PSD1 file looks like. It's a hash table in a text file. It's not particularly difficult. Um, and same sort of format as required modules and other things, I can specify the module name and the version. Or if I don't care, I can get latest. Um, I can set some options. So if I'm saying I want to download these locally into whatever folder I'm working in, so in a dependencies folder, and then add that to my path so that I can import them automatically, I can do that. I can save them to other locations. There's a bunch of other options you can set. Big benefit of setting, installing them to a local path rather than your module path, is that if you're on a CI system or something, you're not going to pollute everybody else's builds. If it's a long, like, a, no, it's a stable CI system that runs all the time. People aren't just going to get, like, 15 different versions of this dependency because you've got 15 different modules that use different versions. You can do, you can pass parameters to um, install module. So, like, if you're installing a version of Pesta and you don't have the right version for the certificates to match up, you can say, yep, just, just skip that publisher check. Don't worry about it. I know it's going to fail, it's going to throw you an error, so ignore it. And yeah, I can specify latest, I can specify what versions I want, where I want things to go. Really, really useful tool. And it's as simple as uh, invoke PS depend, give it a path to probably there. So, I think they, they, they do depend, dependency, and requirements. I think there are three types of files, sort of, kind of like how PES has .tests.ps1. This handles a couple of different formats. But as long as it's PSD1, it doesn't matter. There's a bunch of other options you can specify on it, like quiet and import. Um, the one I want is probably confirm false. So this is going to go away and install these dependencies for me. It's probably going to take a few seconds. But if I then look in here, I should have a dependency <coughs> folder showing up at some point, depending on where I run this from. Yeah. So um, let's pop the other one. Do that. So what? So as I was saying, PS depend also handles different types of dependencies if we need them. So if I do get PS depend type, and pipe to select, uh, is it dependent, type, I think that's the right property, it is not, that, that helps if I can spell, there we go, so as you can see, handles a bunch of different things, so if I want to pull NPM packages down as part of this, because I'm running this as part of my general CI pipeline, or if I want to pull things from Git repos, or GitHub, I can do that. That works really well if you're just pulling stuff straight from a particular branch in Git. Um, there's NuGet, if you want to pull stuff from there. Um, that's generally things like 
well, any of the, the new Getty type stuff that you can get. If you want to download the latest .NET SDKs or a specific .NET SDK, I think Tyler, in fact, added that because it's a quite useful thing. But again, I can handle all of this in a simple PSD1 file. It's all tracked with my code, so as my, as my module develops, my dependencies move with it, which makes a nice big difference. So I do. So I've got a dependency folder there now, and I have got the modules I expect. And if I look in configuration, I can see that's version 131, as I specified. If I look in fact, first, that's not 14, because that's the latest version available. It all works pretty quickly, and I don't need to worry too much about it, because my CI pipeline can handle it. So, any questions about PS depend or uses of it and things? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So it, it will use whatever repositories are available for you at the moment, but you can also specify repository is whatever you call it, and it will download from there. That's the main, it's one of the ways we use it a lot because we've got an internal repo, which then passes through to gallery if we need it to, and we just point it at that. Yeah. Yes, so that, that that's another use we have for it, because I, I make sure I install dependencies to the, sorry? Oh yeah, so the question was, can can you use it for offline dependencies, for offline installs? So yeah, we use it a lot for when we're building modules and things that we're gonna use and run on customer sites, and we're like, those boxes don't have internet, but I have dependencies. So we download them to the local folder, ship it with the module, because it's, it's a bunch of PowerShell files usually, so we don't really care about how much size it's taking up, but it means we can have those dependencies wherever we go. So, so this is pu almost purely for build time sort of thing. So in your module and script, you then have to say where dependencies are. So you do, unfortunately, you have to do input module slash dependencies slash whatever, which is a bit of a pain, but means it actually works <laughs> offline and you don't have to worry about Oh, which dependency did I forget to download? Crap, I've now got to go to a jump box that has internet access to download those dependencies, go through all of the, the, the joys of copying code around and stuff, yeah. But it, it makes it a lot easier, and you, the way we have it is our CI pipeline just outputs a package at the end of it. Here's your module with all of the dependencies, all in a zip file, do with it as you want. Any further questions on PS Depend? Excellent. Uh, my summary slide is really boring. Um, all my sites are on GitHub. I'm on Twitter. If you're not on Slack or Discord, please join us on Slack or Discord. It's wonderful. Um, hopefully now you have an idea of how to manage dependencies, why you should manage dependencies. Um, yeah, I will also put the slides and code up to the main repo. And any questions at all about anything? Related to this topic preferably, but I will answer most questions badly or otherwise. Yes. Yes, I would, because then it puts it right at the top of your, well, you should put that right at the top of your script, because then it's obvious, but it also means that your script fails before it gets to that point. And, yeah, so the question was, should we replace import module blah with hash requires blah, and the answer is generally yes. It's more obvious, scripts fail before they get to that point. Yeah, the usual good things that you want out of this, so it doesn't, like, break your machine or something. Yeah. No, so that, that's true. So the question was, um, if the module isn't in your PS module path, then hash requires won't import it. And that's true. But you, you can't just do a one-for-one -one replacement, but hopefully you know your code well enough to go, I know this module isn't automatically installed, but I'm shipping the module with it, with the scripts or whatever, then stick with import module and specify a path. It's a kind of case-by-case -case basis. But for the most part, if you're just saying import module active directory, you don't need to. Unless you're doing like, here, I'm shipping after directory with my module for some reason. You'll probably run into a bunch of problems if you do that, though. So. Is it, uh, yeah, yeah. So the question was, if you've got some 
functions in a module that require admin and others that don't, then how do we handle that? And unfortunately, hash requires is only for the entire module. So if, as soon as you hit import module and you're not an admin, it'll fail. So there's not a good solution other than just, I guess, run as admin or maybe split those out into a separate module. Um, yep. Yes, yeah. So if, if any of your modules or the dependencies require admin, that's either using required modules or the nested module stuff, then it won't work unless you're an admin. That's just how hash requires works. So, yeah, the question was, does it, um, if you have nested modules and stuff and they require admin, then, again, that, that, that doesn't work because you're not an admin, so none of these will import, so the whole thing falls apart. Something to be aware of, you kind of, like, have to, Figure that out as you go. We've, we've got a couple of modules that require admin. And we're like, every time I try to run it in VS Code, I'm like, I need to restart VS Code's admin and I like, close the other five different instances of code I've got open because I only have one admin this code open. Anything? Any questions? Excellent. Thank you for, for coming and rate, my, rate, rate the sessions. Oh, sorry, one last thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, do I have anything that makes module scaffolding and building stuff easier? Yes and no. Um, I've got a bunch of scripts I wrote that are on my GitHub because I do a talk about module development best practices. It's on YouTube and a bunch of places. Um, mostly, I just rebuild my PSM one. So I have a single. I have. Oh, I do the usual thing of one PS one file, one function. But at build time, I pull them all together into a single PSM1 file. So then when I import the module, it's one big file. All of the classes and stuff work. It just figures itself out. I don't need to worry too much. The only problem is you have to make sure your folders are called the right thing. So if you're using classes, that needs to be called classes. And, or at least something above your other functions. So that when everything gets pulled back together, they all exist in the right order and PowerShell doesn't get confused. Um, there's, there's a couple of solutions out there. Um, I usually recommend... Um, well, there's, there's Plaster and there's Fred's PS module development for doing scaffolding things, and then there's Invoke Build and Sake are the two main build tools. But there's also Module Builder, which is a one for doing the same sort of thing of pulling everything into one file. It's got a bunch of useful other stuff in there. It, they're all on GitHub, um, or go and watch my talk from a bunch of different places about module development best practices, where I talk about that stuff in more depth and why you should do all of that stuff. So, there's no more questions. Please remember to rate people's sessions. Other people's not mine, don't worry about it. Um, and then, thank you for coming.